So we're back for another Tornado Tales, and this time we're with Jerry Ward, who was a former Tornado F3 pilot. So Jerry, I think you've got a story for uh, to share with our viewers. Uh, I started flying the F3 in uh, 1989, and then continued flying it right up until uh, my retirement date from the RAF. And my first uh, operational uh, tour was on 43 Squadron at Lucas. And I arrived there when the, the squadron was still uh, collecting new aircraft and working up. Uh, but then, because we had the latest blocks of aircraft, we got sent out to the Gulf War. So I was immediately made operational and punted out to the Gulf War. Uh, that was uh, obviously the back end of 1990 and then the Gulf War itself during 1991. But by... Uh, spring 1993 the squadron was still collecting new aircraft from BAE systems at Wharton and it was not unusual to just be asked to get on a train or get in a hire car go to BAE systems and collect a new jet but on this occasion it was there's a jet to be collected from RAF Coningsby it's been delivered to the wrong place now when you when you're thinking about your Christmas parcels getting lost by Amazon, that's one thing. But how can you deliver twenty million pounds worth of aircraft to the wrong base? I mean, it's, it's twenty million pounds thirty years ago, but it was delivered to the wrong place. Uh, so we were tasked with heading off from Lucas down to Coningsby, which is a hell of a long way by road or rail. Uh, although Lucas has got a railway station right next to the airbase, mm -hmm. Coningsby is in the middle of nowhere, and the nearest railway station, I think, is Sleaford, mm -hmm. uh, which is miles and miles away. So they very kindly laid on a business jet to fly us down from Lucas to Coningsby. Nice. And nicely in the morning, and on schedule, obviously, an aircraft from the Queen's flight from RAF Northolt arrived, and my backseater, flight attendant Ed Moran, lovely guy, he and I jumped in the back of this HS125, which had very smart, comfy leather seats. <laughs> we felt a bit out of place in our flying suits, immer immersion suits, and with all our survival equipment. And the guys from the Royal Flight weren't particularly keen on us having all our pyrotechnics with us, but we had all kinds of flares and smoke and all that sort of stuff that you had uh, as part of your personal uh, survival equipment in your life jacket. Anyway, we rocked up down at Coningsby and uh, grabbed a quick coffee and then we're told that the aircraft was, uh, was ready to go. And when the jets come out of the factory, obviously all the panels fit really nice and beautifully flush because uh, they've not been opened and closed 300 times by hairy-chested engineers who bend everything, jam spanners and screwdrivers in, and if they can't <laughs> open a panel, they get a big leak crowbar and go, and, uh, and wind the thing open. But the jet was beautifully clean and smooth down both sides. I think it had about uh, one hour and 34 minutes on the clock. Normally, we only log things by five-minute blocks, but the test guys at BAE Systems had to log it to the absolute minimum for flight, and it had done its air test at Wharton and then delivery from Wharton down to Continents Bay. So there we've got a nice shiny jet with one and a half hours on the clock, and it, it was completely clean aircraft. No pylons, no underwing stores, no sidewinder acquisition round, uh, nothing else hanging off the jet whatsoever. It's got a pair of brand new engines in it, which are going to be drum tight and as uh, as powerful as they're ever going to be. And it was a nice crisp February morning. So uh, having had a chat with uh, Ed about how we should get back to Lucas, so said, well, why don't we have a word with ATC? see if we can get a block of airspace up the North Sea. I've been told uh, the best way to accelerate the jet is to get up towards the tropopause and then porpoise the aircraft so you climb a bit, 
and then as you bunt over and descend a bit the aircraft accelerates a bit more and then you climb back up a bit and then descend a bit more so we needed a block of airspace uh, somewhere near the tropopause uh, up somewhere up the North Sea, preferably far enough off uh, off land, offshore, so that uh, we could go as fast as possible. So off we set from Coningsby, turned out over the sea, and pointed north uh, to Scotland, and uh, started climbing up to then uh, get the intake ramps in the in the intakes of the tornado, very much like Concorde had there are some ramps that start to close down so that the front of the engine gets subsonic air. The, the, uh, the fan blades are not designed to accept supersonic air. So the ramps started to open at Mach 1.25. And once the uh, ramps started to open, then the, uh, the engines got some nice, fat, juicy, cold air. So we started chewing on that and producing a bit more power. So you started accelerating a bit more. And the ramps were fully closed down by Mach 1.6. So uh, once you got to Mach 1.6, the acceleration slowed a little bit on your way up towards Mach 2. And then I started to gently uh, porpoise the aircraft heading up uh, the sea. And we got to uh, Mach 2 fairly quickly. Uh, and then I climbed up gently at Mach 2 and then bunted over the top and accelerated a bit more and then started climbing back up again. And obviously we were in just the right piece of air, but the, the jet just kept going and going. And we got to Mach 2.2 and then 2.25. <laughs> And then I looked down at the fuel gauge and thought, shit, <laughs> we're going to run out of gas before we've even got Lucas and we'll, we'll have to divert into Leeming or or even Newcastle uh, Airport to go and get a tank of gas. And then we really are going to be in the CAC when we get back to base, uh, when the, the boss asks what the bloody hell we've been doing. <laughs> so I, at 2.25, I took the jet out of reheat and it was sadly like hitting a wall. Mm. And we, we started slowing down fairly quickly. And at that point, as soon as I took the aircraft out of reheat, the fuel pumps, which pump the fuel from one tank to another, were also the same fuel pumps that powered up the reheat fuel lines. Mm. And the aircraft, being one of the latest blocks of aircraft, came out of the factory with a system that held the fuel in the wings because it was better for fatigue life because it stopped the wings fluttering or moving up and down. Mm. And as soon as I took it out of reheat, the fuel transferred from the wings into the center tanks, front and back tank, which are the ones that were showing on the gauge. And all of a sudden we got about another 750 kgs of fuel and we'd have had tons of fuel to get to Lucas. And I'm quite confident we'd have got to Mach 2.4, maybe wow. even more with the speed that we were accelerating. But, but even at Mach 2.25, uh, I've, I've chatted with loads and loads of guys over the years that have flown the Tornado F3. And I don't know of anyone that's flown one uh, faster, probably because nearly always they had at least pylons hanging off them. Mm. Normally the stub pylons to take the sidewinders as well. And nearly always at least an acquisition round. And of course, as the jets all got a little bit older, then the panels were all a little bit sort of bent and wrinkly on the sides. Uh, I'm sure you've uh, probably seen the one in, uh, in the museum at, uh, at the Zoo Echo 204. Yes. Uh, and you're, if you look carefully down the sides, you'll find very few of the panels really fit absolutely flush anymore. Oh. So, uh, so there you go. 2.25, took it out of reheat, failed miserably. But uh, <laughs> we had plenty of gas to land back at Lucas, uh, and we got the aircraft there without getting it covered in any bugs and things because there weren't any flying at the kind of height we were. 
And the, jet, the aircraft then got handed over to the engineers who promptly took it down, down to the paint shop, painted it in squadron colours, and uh, it got them put in a has and wasn't seen again until it was getting ready to go down to RF Marham for one of the Queen's Jubilee reviews. Uh, so it, by the time it went to Marham, it still had virtually uh, no hours on the clock. And, and the engineers didn't have to spend three weeks scrubbing an aircraft down. <laughs> as soon as you used the reverse thrust, it put crap all over the fin. Mm -hmm. uh, so most other squadrons that presented an aircraft for the Queen's review, uh, their engineers would have had to spend three weeks cleaning one. But uh, we saved the engineers a whole load of work uh, <laughs> by delivering them a nice clean aircraft. And it then spent the rest, or the, the next few years, certainly, at uh, Lucas on 43 Squadron. So, in theory, uh, I'm guessing that was probably, it could be the record for a Tornado pilot and a Tornado jet as well. Quite, quite possibly, uh, Mike, quite possibly. I believe when the aircraft were, were very new and they first went to Boscombe Down uh, to the evaluation centre, they would have taken the jet to Mach 2 because that was its release to service limits. Mm -hmm. I mean, officially, we shouldn't have gone anywhere past Mach 2. Unofficially, you know, you could do almost what you like. I mean, there was a limit as to how fast the jet would go uh, at low level. Uh, and I do know somebody who uh, was flying around uh, the, the cold uh, wastelands of Alaska chasing... Uh, F-16s going very quickly. I, I, I saw over 850 knots indicated airspeed. Uh, and I know one of my buddies uh, saw quite a bit more than that. But again, I don't think we were supposed to be doing those sort of speeds either. <laughs> no, but just going on that point there, uh, Jerry, uh, because normally when these new aircraft come out, they always try to break records. And you think the F uh, F3 was quick. Was there no, right, let's set an official record for the Tornado F3? It, it, it was quick, but only under certain circumstances because mm. it was designed to be a long-range interceptor aircraft, really. Uh, and to head off out over the North Sea mm -hmm. uh, and, you know, defend, well, principally the coast of the United Kingdom and really the north of Scotland. Mm -hmm. uh, I know they'd like to think of it as the Kingdom of Scotland, but the, the north of Scotland from the invading Russians. Mm -hmm. And to, to get out there fairly quickly, which obviously it would do, uh, and then have a reasonable long loiter time. Mm -hmm. And with the, uh, with the bigger tanks on uh, the 2250 litre tanks it could stay uh, it could stay airborne and be out on station on patrol mm -hmm. uh, you know, a good long period of time but it was never really uh, conceived as uh, certainly not as a dog fighting airplane everyone knows that mm -hmm. uh, there were certain regimes when it could just about hold its own mm -hmm. but again the more agile aircraft that there were mm -hmm. spilling around the bazaars, some of the French ones. I uh, prefer not to talk about those. Uh, <laughs> after the football. <laughs> yeah, exactly. So just one last question uh, before we wrap up here, Jerry. So when you landed, um, would the engineers have uh, been able to see that it went uh, 2.25? If they downloaded the trace off the black box, because the, the Tornado was one of the first of the military aircraft, that had a sort of black box in it. So if they downloaded that, then they might have been able to uh, uh, have a little look and see what we'd been up to. But there was no requirement for them to, uh, you know, we hadn't bent the aircraft. But, uh, it was still, you know, clean and straight. Mm -hmm. uh, it was, you know, well, there would have been just simply no point or, or no reason for them to go and download stuff like that. Mm -hmm. And did you uh, put that uh, number actually in your logbook, or were, did it was it needed or anything like that? I, I recorded it in my logbook as uh, VV high speed. <laughs> uh, I mean, bear in mind, your logbook got presented to the flight commander and squadron commander for signature every month. 
-hmm. and even the station commander once a quarter. Uh, mm -hmm. There was no uh, no need for me to record it in my logbook. It was all up there. <laughs> it, it, so yeah, very much all in uh, in amongst the grey matter. <laughs> so I mean, what an incredible story! I mean, everyone knows the Tornado F three is my favourite jet. So to hear that that speed is actually incredible. But to wrap up there, uh, this Tornado Tales episode, Jerry, do you have anything to add? Have you got anything coming up from yourself? Uh, I've been doing a little bit of work uh, with one of the spinal injury charities called Aspire, and they help uh, people with assistive technology. The, the, for the little thing that's attached to the side of my reading glasses uh, that I've got on the screen in front of you, that gives me uh, a head-controlled mouse, and then there's some software on the computer so I can point and click and do. I can left and right click and click and drag. Uh, bear in mind you're moving your head to do it you're out of control a lot of the time uh, the same could be said for most of my life <laughs> but, but I'm doing a, uh, a charity talk and slideshow at the Avro Heritage Museum at Woodford uh, on the 23rd of February next year so 23 Feb 23 mm -hmm. uh, and there'll be a, about a 45 minute or so talk and slideshow followed by a little bit of Q&A, followed by some light refreshments. And then we're having a show, a, a, a bespoke showing of the Lancaster documentary film that came out recently, uh, Lancaster stuff. Above and Beyond. And uh, a fairly well-known aviation photographer, John Dibbs, is the aerial director and producer of the film. So uh, he's allowed the, muse the Heritage Trust to uh, have a, their own special showing so that they can sell tickets and raise funds for the Avro Museum and for Aspire. Brilliant stuff. And is that a ticketed event, Jerry? And uh, where can people find it, yeah, if so? Uh, ticket, tickets should be going on sale shortly. Uh, for it, It's a, an all-afternoon type thing because uh, the movie itself is about an hour and three quarters or thereabouts. So I think it'll be three hours or so's worth. Uh, and tickets will be going on sale uh, in a little while. You'll be able to find out by going to the events uh, bit of the Avro Heritage Museum website. Brilliant stuff. And I'll link that all in the description for our viewers. And once the tickets come out, I'll put it on social media. So if any of you guys want to get one and, and uh, head over there, I will let you know. But Jerry, thanks very much for coming on and sharing that story. It's been absolutely bri brilliant and uh, privilege to talk to you. Well, my pleasure. The very best uh, to uh, all aviators out there. And uh, a very Merry Christmas and a, a great happy 2023 when it comes. Cheers. Thank you.